Podcast. We demystify what goes on behind the therapy room door. Join us on this voyage of discovery and co-creative conversations. This is The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast with Bob Cook and Jackie Jones. Hello, welcome back to the next episode of The Therapy Show with Bob Cook and myself, Jackie Jones. And following on from the theme that we've been covering over the last few weeks, um, this week's podcast is working with the child with eating disorder. Yes, whether it be bul- yeah, bulimia or bulimia or anorexia or you know, traits of any of those things, yes. Yeah. Again, somebody who I haven't worked with, I, I've, I've not worked with anybody with eating disorders. It's never come up. You must have done in some ways, even if it's like... Maybe unhealthy eating, maybe, maybe <laughs> issues around food, but not an actual disorder. Uh, well, we need to get to a continuum then. Yes. Um, eat, <laughs> it's like all these things, isn't it? There's a continuum. Yes. Or from what you might call unhealthy eating behaviours all the way up to a disorder where the person feels driven unconsciously um, to a place where they either starve themselves or overeat to yeah. levels of obesity. On the other level, which we can call the disorder, and that's, this level is very fixed, whereas this level is much more flexible and they feel they have some ability to regulate their habits, if you like. So you will have worked somewhat. You, you will have on, worked. On, yes. Yeah. With people on those continuums. On the continuum, yes. Not the disorder as in a diagnosed disorder. Yeah. yeah because if you yes. have a disorder like anorexia or bulimia, yeah. and they feel so fixed and black and white where they actually, you're in a... Uh, a power battle to death well then we're at a disorder level yes yeah but you will have worked somewhere on that spectrum yes i agree you be surprised if you haven't i am probably on that spectrum myself (laughs) yeah we are i think you know you know i think uh i don't know a high majority but many 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 people struggle with eating issues yeah on that continuum and then yes. if you like you might look at a disordered level where it becomes a more battle for survival and more of a latter battle really for life or death yes yeah yeah so, so have, yes on the continuum definitely definitely work people with unhealthy eating patterns haven't you yes yeah yeah okay great so this is what we're doing would you so- say that the 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 spectrum maybe the upper end of it is it's a form of self-harm well, that's an interesting one by definition it is but you know it is also driven so yes save alcoholic you know an alcoholic yeah. will self-harm yeah of course uh a driven smoker self-harm i mean in, in that definition yes and um they're usually driven to do that. So, yes, it is. But at its as it, at its essence, people who are, who are overweight to the obesity level or starve themselves, their their defences against trauma. Yeah. And control. Now, when we about trauma, we then have a continuum, don't we? As well, there's all yeah. continuums. Yeah. So. You know, we can talk about, you know, neglect being trauma. We can talk about invasion of psych being trauma. We can we can have definition of trauma. Um, but I think eating disorders at these sorts of levels are defense against trauma. Yeah. However we define trauma. Yeah. Because it's their way of controlling things it's their attempt to cope okay in a world uh which is so frightening for them so if we look at eat, eating issues as a whole then i i remember way back uh probably i would think in my first 
three or four years of clinical practice. So we're going back a long time. I worked with somebody who was uh, anorexic and was in this yo-yoing phase of, and back then, so we're talking about, about, oh God, late 1980s, perhaps 1990. And most hospitals at that time had six stone as a sort of um, mark Off point, yeah. when a person goes to the hospital and then they, you know, they may force feed them or, 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 or so they can get them, you know, up to a reasonable weight. Then they go back out of hospital again and then they go back into this process. So you get a yo, what I call a yo-yoing process. And this woman was in that. Um, and I, I don't really know how much I helped her to tell you the truth, because what happened was that as we started to explore the, her history, remember I'm a beginning therapist in many ways, I, uh, and she started to talk about some of her early history. Her mother, her mother phoned up and said that she was going to take her out of uh, therapy and take her to Cheadle Royal Priory where she would have this um, very expensive therapy, which she did. So I never know what, quite what happened to her, but I do know that is a perfect example of uh, what I think is the premise of working with people with eating problems. In other words, um, it got acted out in front of me, but it's usually the internalized parent, which is bearing down on the child. So it's a power battle. You forget, you say control, yeah, um, and food becomes the battleground. Yeah, so yeah. In the, in the transaction analysis, the internalized parents and the younger self. Yeah, makes perfect sense. So that got enacted out, where the internalized parent, in reality, stopped the therapy and took her away. Now. I was very, very, very early on in my life as a psychotherapist. It'd be a very different ball game now. But I did learn something back then uh, before the parent came along and sort of ended the therapy in some ways. But I learned that people who, uh, how can I explain this? What I've just said to you, I'll just repeat it again. The food becomes the battleground between the parent and the child. Yeah. In PA terms. Yeah. Yeah. Hundred percent, and and I would imagine used as leverage and bargaining and all sorts of things. If it's the battleground, it's it's a weapon to use. Yeah, because think about. I mean, you were right right at the beginning. You were completely correct right at the beginning of this podcast when you talk about the subject of control. Mm. And that is, what can a person control? Now, very few things, especially when they're being uh, in this battle against the parent. But one of, the, one of the things they can do is control what goes in and out of their body. Yeah. So in that sense, you're correct. It's a battle for control. Yeah. So at least you can do many other things you can tell me off, you can talk to me, you can define me, you can do X, but you can't dictate what goes in and out of my body because I'm not going to allow you to. I'll starve myself or I'll overeat my death or, or I'll overeat myself to death. Yeah. Yeah. Because w would you kind of group the same things together if you're talking anorexia and bulimia and those sorts of things with you know phobias around food or the texture of food or the act of swallowing food would you put that under an eating disorder umbrella if there was such a thing eating challenges or eating issues or eating problems and they're all part of the same process as what i think uh, in terms of what I've just said, is that it's a struggle of, for control. And of course, phobias and everything else comes off the back of this. Yeah. Um, and the internalized parents and the younger self. Yeah. Now, so if you're working with somebody with eating issues, whether it's anorexia or bulimia or overeating, um, 
you you are it's a, I can explain with you a is again it's a slow work so it's a long long therapy and yet in its essence you're helping the client get hold of their younger self and you're helping them to pr promote autonomy in other words to be able to think feel and be the age they are in the face of this heavily internalized parent yeah so you have to take on the internalized parent but of course you need first of all to get the on the side of the in ta terms again the younger child so they feel protected enough to be able to stand up to the internalized parent. Yeah. And food has become the battleground, like I said earlier on. Yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. I don't I don't know why, but I keep thinking about permission and, and you know giving them permission. Mm. To what? I'm not sure. That's what I'm thinking about. I'm trying to work it out. That, that rather than be me being embroiled in that battleground as well between the internalized parents and the child, to kind of give the child permission to have that autonomy to, yeah, you know, there doesn't need to be a battle with the internalized parent to give them permission. <laughs> but I'm not sure what the permission is for. Well, it's permission to be themselves and to have feelings and have thoughts and have a, a sense of a life outside the parent. So, yes, in, in a very simplistic framework, yes. Yeah. In a much more complex framework, though, is how you do that, how you get to that place where somebody's got such a highly, uh, highly destructive internalised parent, though it may not seem like that to the real parent, but anyway... Um, how do you get to a place where they feel psychologically protected and strong enough to be able to stand up to that parent and take, you know, to get, yeah, in some ways, yeah, verbal permissions, that's part of the process. Um, so permissions is correct, but, you know, the framework is how you do it. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because it, it, it is really complex when you're talking about again it's two parts of the self isn't it to a to a certain extent the, the the parents part there's an impasse going on where there's this internal dialogue constantly around everything and well, it, is it because it's just focused on the food issue well i remember a client of mine who binged regularly um and purged herself so you're in that cycle yeah and she would talk about oh you know i just found myself by the fridge oh it's three o'clock in the morning I just, and i just found myself opening the fridge but let's let's look at a statement you know people many times and often will use food as a way of eating their feelings. Mm. So if you trace back and you said to your client or said to my client, oh gosh, so let's go back, say half an hour before you found yourself at the fridge. What were you thinking and feeling? And I remember her saying, well, I was feeling like and I remember saying this, though it's not a feeling, it's a thought. But anyway, she said, I was feeling like I hated myself. And I feel I was feeling a level of self-disgust. And I was feeling so worthless and so futile in the life that I wanted to not be in this planet. So what does she do? She goes and eats. Mm -hmm. The function of the eating in this level is to eat the feelings away. Yeah. 
I, I find it fascinating how we as human beings work out ways to do things like that. You find it fascinating? Yeah. So in other words, do you find psychological defences to trauma, to neglect, to all the things we've been talking about in these podcasts in many ways, defences fascinating? Yeah. Okay. I don't think we work it out, you see. No, that's what I mean. It's not it's a human conscious human. thing, is it? I just find it fascinating. Yeah. Well, good. That's that's probably what was the motivation behind you training to be a psychotherapist for four years and what you do now. Quite possibly. Why you on this podcast? <laughs> Even <laughs> now, I am in awe of us as human beings and how we we survive and thrive, to use your words, by doing certain things. Well, it's a, it's a, I'm not really a Freudian. I, uh, in many, uh, not a Freudian, but but let's go back to some of the instinctual drives he talked about. You know, I do think there's an innate instinct drive. You know, to to live and to to actually survive and to you know often what in ancient words called physis the the the, the you know the, the the actual drive to 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 be in this this planet and i think we have developed psychological defenses to enable us to psychologically survive the best we can to function yeah and that might mean splitting off between thinking and feeling you know it might mean many things that we put in unconscious unconscious compartments um that we deal with later even though we may have flashbacks and triggers but at least we're surviving in a certain way yeah it doesn't mean that survival is actually particularly wonderfully whole but at least we are so we are still in this planet at a, at a, at a psychological level i think that's the bit i find fascinating <laughs> That yeah. we work out, you know, with what we've got available at the time, how to survive. And at the time, it makes perfect sense. So, you know, what triggered that for me was you saying eating their feelings. And at some level, that made perfect sense. Great. So then, instinctually, you know how to work with eating disorders then. Yes. Because what you, what, if we take that fascination of yours you what you are going to do is enable them to express what they ate in emotional ways in other words you go back to half an hour before they found themselves in the fridge and you help them express what they weren't able to express for whatever reasons which you will work out in therapy and as you start to do that and then they start to deal with um what they've eaten if you like or not expressed yeah you will get to the healing process yeah this here bob is why i love my job literally this so what the, we're talking about the, the insights the you know us as human beings that we're all unique and amazing and you know i, I do believe that ultimately we all want to be here you know that that need to survive and yeah. exactly like you said be on the planet now that's amazing yeah i don't know if it's fascinating for me but it's amazing that in the most dreadful of human conditions psychologically uh that we we wish to be on this planet even if we deaden ourselves to life yeah people have been wow. sexually abused people have been highly traumatized the way they cope is to in inverted commas basically what however we talk about it is to deaden themselves to like to those feelings mm. trauma so they can psychologically live and of course the problem the problem is that as they start to do that 
and they start to relate to the world in different ways, then relationships or other parts of themselves get triggered. And then that compartment where they've hidden parts of themselves away starts to leak out. Yeah. Yeah. So part of working with eating disorders is to help the person find, find enough autonomy and strength to be able to give them, I'll use your word, give themselves permissions to grow up and be the age they are and um, self-define themselves rather than in this internal battle with their internalized parent. Who doesn't actually allow them, who who doesn't allow them to grow up? Yeah. Which again, you know, it, it must be exhausting to be in a world where there is that internal conflict and battleground all the time. That's right. Now that will get enacted out in the therapy room. So any therapist listening to this, you're absolutely right, Jackie, about permissions, but you need to put the protection in first. Yes. And you need to uh, test that out. In other words, the relationship needs to be strong enough for the client to feel that they are protected by you in the work or the service of healing, which means taking on the internalized parent and, and therefore allowing, if you want to use those words, the client to take charge of their own autonomy and be the age that they are uh, today. Yeah. But it will mean more than anything else, taking on the internalized negative parent. Is this the permission, protection, importance? Well, that's, yeah, yeah. And that's a very good way of looking at it. That by being potent and involving yourself in that therapeutic process and giving the verbal permissions and standing up to the internalized parent, you're providing a different environment, if you like, for the person to understand themselves, empower themselves, and in inverted commas, grow up. Yeah. Yeah. So there's an, another treatment plan of working with people, but you see, it's not linear, and it'll take quite a long time. Yes, yeah. Yeah. When you're doing these processes in the therapy room, do you explain to your client what's happening? Do you feed back after that, that what we've just actually done is? Well, I tell you what, working with eating disorder, yes, the answer is yes, but in a way which is accessible to them. Yeah. So, you know, OK, many people listening here might not have been trained in transaction analysis, but the transaction analysis model of parent, adult, or child and the three parts of the self, I will often do what I call it educative therapy to give themselves a, a shared language to understand very complex processes like what we're talking about. Yes, and yeah. I think the PAC model is a really good way to explain that. Yeah, yeah. So, yes, I do. But often in the in this in the in in the service of the client i may teach them what i call educative therapy that pac model which i think is very useful when we talk about an internalized parent which is bearing down on the child yes yeah yeah now the I'm... therapist this is why i like the model the therapist becomes hopefully one of the new internalized parent figures Yeah. And you can teach that from an educative therapeutic place. Yeah. So I, I think that's important to, to have that, that understanding for when they're outside of the therapy room, you know what I mean? That they can literally visualize what's going on when they feel that urge, that drive, that, that compulsion to do certain things. Mm, absolutely. Yeah. Coming from the younger self. No, it was the young self which has been so defined by the internalized parent yeah so that, 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 that what happens is they they move to adapt either being perfect pleasing it's a really big thing with people with eating disorders to get by in the world 
and what's not happening is is they're not separating out um, being appropriate of the age they are now they stay as a younger child if you like yeah and food is a way a really good way to push down feelings yes yeah literally swallowing it that it is yeah and the other one another thing about eating disorder it's a very good way to structure time yes uh so they structure time instead of feeling in inverted commas bored or uh, uh feeling all these feelings they can structure time by eating something yeah or not just eating something eating lots of something <laughs> yeah i think what one of the things that comes up you know with a lot of my clients i, I don't know whether it's related around foods that, that i'm seeing them for but that you know food is connected with an awful lot of life events whether that's you know when we're celebrating or when we're commiserating or you, do you know what i mean i i need to comfort myself so we eat food or you know i'm celebrating my successes so we eat food it's kind of like a cultural thing sometimes as well food well, of course we, you know we can in ta the whole, the whole concept of the cultural parent and you're perfectly right but eating eating is a way we structure time yeah, yeah. Culture we're in. Yeah, so yeah. Correct. Even There's literally a... structuring time, breakfast, dinner, tea, <laughs> the, the, the day is structured around yeah. food on a, on a literal sense. Yeah. The TA book by Kathy Leach it was written about 10 years ago, which I was looking at this podcast, and it was called The Overweight Patient A Psychological Approach to, to Understanding Working with Obesity by Kathy Leach, and she's a TA therapist, and she gives a TA uh, model for working with uh, eating issues, but particularly the overweight patient. And she takes the frame I've just been talking about, which is the battle against the internalized parent, which is giving them certain commands, uh, XXX. So, well, I just think of, a, my parents for example uh i would think my mother every day of my life when we we're eating um if i left any food would say you better eat up all that food just think of all the uh people starving in biafra it was back then in the 1960s yeah, yeah. So i developed a guilt complex yeah so there's a you can see there's a lot in this as yeah explore the stories and the parental slogans and the cultural the parental cultural norms yes and as i say the younger child then survives usually by adapting pleasing or being perfect and staying young and uh, the, the, the therapies are around enabling them through permissions and protection to take autonomy uh of autonomy I'll put it grow up because I mean it's psychologically and develop new healthy patterns of eating. Yeah. Yeah, it's worth looking at that book. It sounds it sounds interesting. Yeah. 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 It's only about 20 pounds, it's paperback. Yeah. It's about 10 years old, 2011, I think, or might be 2009. But it's ageless in a way because it explains how to use the PAC model when working with overweight clients and talks about what I've been talking about for the last, or we've been talking about for the last minute, which is the internalized parental battle with the regressed child ego state. Yeah. Bob, as always, you're a wealth of information. Good talking to you. You I'm blow my mind every session. I'm so pleased that we're doing this together. Oh, good. It's fascinating. Is that the word from you? Oh, amazing. Absolutely. absolutely. <laughs> Blows my mind. I'm fascinated. Yeah. Well, I enjoy talking about these things. And, you know, there's many, 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 many things. I think that uh, it would be talked sometime or other to talk about methods in the psychotherapy room, like the two chair technique or visualizations and metaphors. So there's so many podcasts uh, we've got lined up. But I, I have enjoyed particularly talking about the last two, which has been 
uh, working with the e eating challenges and the one previously which was working with sexual abuse and the road to thriving. From surviving to thriving, yeah, love it. So we're going to keep the next episode title a surprise. Yes, because we've got so many topics. We thought he, both of you and myself can actually look at uh, which one's next. And uh, yeah, let's keep it a, a sense of anticipation. Oh, yes. Which I think, you know, if we're talking about psychotherapy, I think quite often we're dealing with a person's uh anticipation or lack of anticipation but let's keep the anticipation process going 100 percent. so we're keeping it behind closed doors absolutely so looking forward to the next podcast whatever that may be i shall see you very soon bob take care we'll take care bye bye, bye. <laughs> You've been listening to The Therapy Show, Behind Closed Doors podcast. We hope you enjoyed the show. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review. We'll be back next week with another episode.